weep. Weep with those that weep. You don't laugh when somebody's weeping. You what? See, if you can't find and think of something to cry about when somebody's crying, it, you got to drink from both cups. Negative is part of the life experience. In fact, I teach kids that you got to be, you got to think negative when it's positive. I teach kids the ant philosophy. I think part of it's in the new video. Teaching kids the ant philosophy. Here's a couple of pieces of the ant philosophy. Number one, ants never quit. What a great philosophy. If they're going somewhere and you stop them, I'm telling you, they'll look for another way. And how long will they look? Until they find it or die. What a great philosophy. Here's number two. Ants think winter all summer. Why do you suppose it looks like they're always in a hurry? <laughs> you can't think summer all summer. We'll call you naive at the worst. An ancient story says don't build your house on the sand in the summer. Why? It's easy to get faked out by blue sky and fleecy clouds. You can't get faked out by the summer, build your house on the sand. What a tragedy that would be just to think summer all summer. You can't think summer in the summer. You've got to think winter in the summer. You've got to think negative when it's positive. You say, well, how can you think winter when it's a blue sky and fleecy clouds? You've got to try or get somebody that's been through a winter and let them come scare you to death. <laughs> say, let me tell you about these winters that can come. Say, oh, no, I'm just going to sit here and think positive. We'll come get your children. Take them to safety. Here's what you've got to do in the summer. Think enough about winter to find you a rock. To build your house on a rock. Why? The storms are going to come. You say, blue sky. No, you don't understand. You can't get faked out by blue sky. You've got to think negative when it's positive. One of the best scenarios I've got is the summer. On the weekend seminar, we'll get into it on that next seminar if you attend. The study of the seasons. The title of my first book was called The Seasons of Life. And I'll go through all four seasons with you in that seminar. But let me pick out one right now to illustrate my point. It's called the season of summer. Here's what's unique about the summer. You've got two challenges in the summer. Number one, to nourish your values. Number two, to fight the threat to your values. In the summer, you've got to nourish your good and fight your evil. You've got to nourish the garden and fight the weeds. Summer is a challenging time. In the summer, you must nourish like a mother. And you must destroy like a father. Love like a mother. Hate like a father. In the summer, give life like a mother to your values. And take life like a father. Take the life of your enemy. Lest they what? Take the life of your family. Father says to whatever threatens his family, take three more steps toward this family, you'll cease to exist. I'm father. I kill. In the summer, you've got to love like a mother and hate like a father. If you don't love and hate, I'm telling you, I pity your chances for the future. You say, well, I've been just taught to love. We'll send you off to love La La Land. You can't just love... <laughs> Ancient script says the best what? Love good and what? Hate evil. Love good and hate evil. One of the greatest conversions of all time, the man said later after his conversion. The things I once hated, I now love. And the things I once love, I now hate. Next seminar, we'll teach communications. How parents ought to put love and hate in the same sentence. You've got to put love and hate sometimes in the same sentence. I love you, you say to your child, but I hate what's happening. I love you, but I hate where you're going. I love you, but I hate what's going on. Love your friends and what? Hate your enemies. Now it is possible, yes, to love like a father and hate like a mother. Just so you get both done. <laughs> Nothing more dangerous than an angry mother. <laughs> Especially in the animal kingdom. Beware, Mama Bear. 
If she thinks you're after her cubs, you'll cease to exist. She kills. You've got to be like that. But that's the key. Both nourish and kill. Give life and take life. Love and hate. So important to understand this twin scenario of life. You've got to be like your bloodstream. That's one of the best illustrations, your bloodstream. Red corpuscles to what? Nourish and give food and give life. White corpuscles to what? Fight like a father and take life. Thank God for white corpuscles that think negative all day. White corpuscles say, just show me some infection, I'll kill it. <laughs> Why? If I don't kill it, what? It kills you. You got to love and hate. You got to give life and take life. Tyranny takes over Kuwait in the form of Saddam Hussein. Tyranny's been doing that for the last six and a half thousand years every time it gets a chance. It takes over. Extinguishes the light of freedom and liberty. So what are we going to do? You say, well, it's just a little country. Well, what if Saddam now wants Saudi Arabia? Say, well, we're way over here. Well, then what if he wants Israel? I'm telling you, tyranny knows no restraint of appetite. And tyranny cannot be rehabilitated. It's got to be destroyed like an infection. It's been going on for six and a half thousand years and didn't Hitler teach us well? Didn't Stalin teach us well? As if tyranny knows no restraint of appetite, there's only one way to get rid of it, and that's kill it. So George Bush was right. Draw a line in the sand. Consult with the Allies. Send a half a million troops to Saudi Arabia and finally to Kuwait and kick Saddam tyranny out of Kuwait. Six and a half thousand years of history says you've got to do it. You've got no choice. Hired Chief White Corpuscle, General Schwarzkopf. <laughs> now, next piece. We all have enemies. You gotta do your share of negative thinking. How to destroy your enemies. Ancient story said they returned to rebuild the walls of the temple in the city for their future. And as they built the walls of the temple in the city, they had a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other hand. The trowel was for what? To build their future. The sword was for what? Their enemies. I'm asking you to get just as good at the sword as you are at the trowel. So what are some of the enemies? Now here's the clue. Some of the enemies are on the outside, like Saddam Hussein, and some of them are on the inside. Let's talk about some of the enemies on the inside that you've got to take sword to and destroy them before they destroy you. Here's number one, indifference. What a tragic disease this is. Indifference, ho-hum, let it slide. Tragic. Take sword to this enemy. Here's one problem with drift. You can't drift to the top of the mountain. Next one, enemy of all of us, indecision. Indecision is called the thief of opportunity. Let it steal your chances for a better spring. Let it steal your chances for a fortune of the future. I'm telling you, it's tragic of the immense proportion. Indecision, take sword to this enemy, indecision. Next is doubt. Sure, there's room for healthy skepticism. You can't believe everything, but you can't let doubt then take over. Doubt the past and doubt the future and doubt each other and doubt the government and doubt the possibilities and doubt the opportunities and worst of all, doubt yourself. I'm telling you, it'll destroy your life and destroy your chances, empty your purse and your heart. Doubt is an enemy. Go after it. Next is worry. We've all got to worry some, but don't let worry conquer you. Let it alarm you. We've all got to be alarmed, but we don't want to be conquered. Worry is useful. Three o'clock in the morning, your daughter's not home yet. You've got to worry. <coughs> New York City, step off the curb. One of those Zayla taxis is coming. You've got to worry. <laughs> they don't stop like California. But now you can't let worry loose like a mad dog loose in the house, drive you into a small corner. Here's what you've got to do with your worries. Drive them into a small corner. Whatever's out to get you, you got to get it. Whatever's pushing on you, you got to push back. Guess where illness is in your life right now? Testing the outer edges of your health plan. Looking for a weak spot. 
And if illness can find a weak spot, it'll muscle in and take the territory. Unless you've got enough discipline and power to say, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to fight illness like an enemy. I'll do enough push-ups to destroy illness. And if you don't do the push-ups and you don't get a book on nutrition and you don't take care of your good health, illness says, we'll soon have this clown. <laughs> do battle with your enemy. These opposites are in conflict and we're caught in the middle. Darkness and light, liberty and tyranny, illness and health, success and failure, death and life, good and evil. Next is overcaution, the timid approach to life. Timidity is not a virtue, it's an illness. And if you let it go and go and go, it'll conquer you, leave you without a promotion. Timid people don't get promoted. They don't advance and grow and become powerful in the marketplace. Not timidity. And it is possible to conquer it. Don't let your illness conquer you. Don't let your shyness conquer you. Don't let your worries conquer you. They're your enemy. Take sword to your enemies. Drive them into as small and manageable a corner as you possibly can so that you can flourish in the rest of the house. The next one is pessimism. Pessimism is the enemy of us all. You've got to educate your own pessimism. Tendency to pessimism. To the pessimist, the glass is what? Half empty. But here's also what pessimist, pessimism will try to get you to believe. It's only half empty. You've got to say, well, pessimism, that's ignorant. It's not only half empty, it's also what? Half full. Don't let your pessimism try to get you to believe something is only. It isn't only. Somebody says, well, I'm so positive I only see it half full. Well, it's also half empty. Can't you handle that? <laughs> That's going to ruin your day and ruin your future. The guy says, well, I don't let people talk negative around me. Well, my, we'll put you in some freaky colony. <laughs> Come on, can't you handle a little negative talk? Can't you handle a little truth? Can't you handle a little tragedy around you? Yes, of course. Come on. Walk out of first grade, second grade. Don't let your life become shallow, saying, oh, no negative stuff around me. That's silly. Become mature. Become powerful. But then don't let pessimism trick you into saying it's only one way. It isn't only one way. It is also half full. But it's not only half full. It is half empty. Here's the last one, complaining. There's room for legitimate complaint. But if you let this one loose, it'll conquer you. Complaining, take over your life, destroy you and leave you without anything. Nobody wants to take along a complainer. Nobody wants to promote a complainer. Nobody wants to live with one. Nobody wants to operate with one. Nobody wants to be a partner of one. Nobody wants to have one around. It'll lace you out of more opportunity than you can possibly imagine. Let this disease take over, grab you by the throat. If you don't think this one is bad, ask the children of Israel, of Old Testament fame. Typical of us all, their story just happened to get in the book. Story says, children of Israel were slaves. God performed a series of dazzling miracles and got them out. And now they're heading for the promised land. Remember the story? Heading for the promised land. Tragedy of the story. They never got there. Reason. From day one, they started to gripe. <laughs> they griped about the food. They just got delivered from slavery, and now they're saying, this food's not all that hot. I mean, give us a break. How much can you take? They whined and cried and griped about the water. In the desert, they got water. But they say, this water doesn't taste that good. I mean, give us a break. <laughs> they whined and cried and griped about the leadership that delivered them from slavery. Said, this leadership's not all that competent. I mean, give us a break. They whined and cried because it was too hot. It was too cold. It was too far. It was too difficult. It was too rocky. They whined and cried for years. Finally, God said, I've had it. Trip canceled. <laughs> oh. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> the story says... They died in the desert, never got to the promised land after all that trouble. Which I guess means two things. One, indulge in this complaining long enough, you'll get your future canceled. Future promotions, future anything. Nobody wants to be around. And I guess the story also means even God himself can only take so much. <laughs> now, 
Now, that's the negative side. Think negative when it's positive. Learn to hate evil. Love good. Hate tyranny. Love liberty. Learn to love health. Hate it, sickness. Now here's the last one. This is the positive side of the seminar. Got to get to the positive. Here's some emotions that can change your life in a single day. I call it the day that turns your life around. Let me just give you this list as we wrap up here today. Emotions that can change your life in a single day. Here's the first one, disgust. That's a powerful emotion, disgust. Disgust now is a negative emotion, but it can have a very positive effect. Disgust says, I've had it. What a glorious day that could be, the day you've had it. You say, I've been on my knees for the last time. What a glorious day that could be. Enough is enough. No more. Powerful day. Even if it's a negative day. I met a beautiful, sophisticated superstar lady in New York. She worked for this jewelry company, very young. Vice president, made big money. This company brought me in to do some training, some seminars, classes. And I met this lady, extraordinary lady. Found out she never went to college, never went to university. I thought, whoa, how'd she get here? So I asked her a little bit about her story. I said, how'd you get here? No college, no university? This is tough New York. Vice president, big money, jewelry business. She said, well, let me tell you part of the story. She said, a few years ago, being a very young mother, she said, one day I asked my husband for $10. And he said, what for? She said, Mr. Owen, I promised myself before that day was finished, I would never, ever ask again. She said, I started looking for opportunity, found it. Started looking for the skills, the classes, found them. And she said, yes, now I am vice president, jewelry company. I do make big money. It is tough New York. But that's one of the reasons why I got here. She said, I promise you, Mr. Rohn, from that day until this, I have never, ever asked again. A powerful day. Here's the next one. Decision. What a powerful day that can be, decision making. If you went home today and in the next few days made a list of decisions that you ought to be making, make the easy ones fast. 